so good to be in this place. And I'm so grateful that you have joined us this morning to glorify the name of God. Amen. I do believe God has something special for our lives today. He has something special for his people. The only thing that we have to do is come into his presence with expectation. Expectation in our spirits, in our hearts, in our minds for what God can do for us today. And not only that, I believe it's important that we worship him and we recognize his greatness today. So before we enter into this service, how about we just lift up our hands tonight and let's just glorify God. Invite him in the room, wherever you're at right there, wherever you're at listening. Just invite him into your room and worship him. Welcome him into, into wherever you're at right now. And let's just praise him today. Father, we love you, God. We glorify you, Jesus, as a people, God. We do love God this evening, Lord Father, because you are worthy of all of the praise today. And because you are worthy, God, we're going to give it to you today, God. We're going to lift our voice, God. We're going to lift our voices to you and make a joyful noise, Lord God. Even in our homes, God, we will fill our homes with your praises, God, because you are good, Lord Father. Receive it today as we glorify you, Jesus, as we lift up your name, God. And I pray, God, that as we lift you up, God, you would descend down, Father, in your power. Descend down, God, in the power of the Holy Ghost, God with every family, with every individual, God, whether they're in their home, God, whether they're driving, they're driving in their cars, Lord God, wherever they may be right now, God, I would pr I pray, God, you would just loose your spirit upon us, God, as we praise you and we glorify you today. And we'll be sure to give you all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you as you praise the Lord with us.
want more of God in their lives tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. It's such a powerful concept, just such a powerful thing to desire more of God. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Amen. What does it mean to want God more and more? It's me. It means to want more and more of integrating God into more and more of your life, to every area of your life. Amen. 
It's all right. It's one thing to want God in a certain area here and there. A Sunday morning, perhaps even a Wednesday evening. Wanting God just a little bit here and a little bit there. But what makes this song so powerful is that it calls upon the deep desire of God's people to want God in everything, in every part of our lives, hey, in every part of our existence, in the air that we breathe in the morning, in the day that we live, hallelujah, throughout the day, I feel God. Every night when we go to sleep, we want more of Him. Does anyone want more, anyone want more of Him tonight? Amen. If you want more of Him, why don't we just tell Him that for a few moments right now and tell God, Lord, Father, we desire you, Lord. We desire you more, God. Lord, we have not ceased, God, being hungry, God. But we're hungry for you again today, God. Not that you haven't been enough. No, you have been enough. But we desire even more, God. We want to lives. We want to know you, God, in our everyday, God. We want to know you in our homes. We want to know you, God, as we go throughout our day, God, every morning and every night. God, we want more of you, Jesus. We want more of you, God, every day. Praise God. Praise God. Wherever you're at, just give a hand praise to the Lord. Just glorify him right now. Just lift your voice to heaven. We love you. We worship you. We thank you, God, for the presence that we feel here, here in this place and with your people, God. Well, today we're going to pray for our city again because we do need him more even in our city. We need his power in our neighborhoods. We need his power on our streets. We need his power on our families. And every time we come to service, we call down the name of Jesus upon our situations. So we're going to pray today again. And we're going to declare the power of God, the Spirit of God upon our city. We're going to declare the north, the south, and the east, and the west to give up their souls so that they can come and know who God is. Can you pray with me today? Father, we come before your presence, God, tonight. Lord, Father, we know, God, it is you who we need in our lives, God, tonight. It is you that we need, Father. We need you, God, in our city once again, Lord, Father. I pray right now, Lord God, that your power, God, would continue, Jesus, just coming down upon our city, God, and giving us revival, Lord Jesus. I pray, God, that your spirit, God, would continue, Jesus, to just begin infiltrating, Lord God, every aspect of government, every aspect of society, God, that you would begin to integrate, God, divine purpose, Lord Father. You would bring the souls, God, to your house, God. You would, you would bring souls to the house of God today, Lord Father. We pray over the north and the south and the east and the west today that they would give up their souls, Lord God, that they would come to you, God, and come to know that you are the one and true and living God today. We declare it in the name of Jesus, God. Every backslider, God, today, Father. And you would stir up your word in their hearts. And you would stir up your word in their minds. So that they can come back to the knowledge of who you are. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. We declare it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's now time for a Wednesday evening tithe and offering. It's a good thing to give to the Lord, and it is part of our worship to Him. Amen. So as you give tonight, just know that you are giving in worship to the Lord today. God bless you tonight as you give.
hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. I'm so excited to be here with you once again today, amen. We're going to go into the Word of God this evening, and I know that God has something to tell us today. I'm so excited to share uh, this Word today. It is in connection with not last week's uh, message, but two weeks ago where I talked about uh, the Sabbath, and I talked about how Jesus Christ is our Sabbath and our rest. Today, I want to continue in this mini-series, and I want to talk about the God who carries our burdens today. Now, where this uh, where this uh, message today stands in relationship with what was preached about Jesus Christ being our rest is that when we spoke two weeks ago about Jesus being our rest and actually the fulfillment of the Sabbath and the very reason why we don't really keep the Sabbath as was expressed in the law of Moses. As Christians, we do not do that, but we know that is the fulfillment, and he himself is the Sabbath. But where, this, uh, where that sermon stands is that we were talking about what the Word of God is telling us is our obligation towards Jesus Christ in believing that he, God does all things perfectly and all things well in the fact that he completed his complete work in six days and he rested on the seventh and also it, it is it, it the God God expects us or the, we have learned through the word of God that we are supposed to trust him to provide our every need which is where the manna came down they were to collect manna for six days and trust in God to provide for the seventh day and it also means that we are supposed to trust that God, he is able to, to go above and beyond anything we can ever earn, which means we don't, we don't earn the favor of God. We haven't earned it. There's nothing we can do to deserve it. God is better to us than we can ever be to ourselves. Amen. And we must accept the fact that this is all by a, provided because of the great grace and mercy that he has towards us. Now, today, I want to take the other perspective and kind of, I want to talk about our position towards what God is trying to do in our lives because the truth is, is that it is many times difficult to trust in God for that which seems impossible and it goes against the very nature of what it means even to be human and I'm going to go into that a little bit here in this sermon today but I'm going to talk about a little bit about what happens in us when we are challenged with the fact that we are called by God to give our burdens over to him. So I want to take us first here to the book of 1 Peter, and I want to start here in chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 7, and it says here, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another, and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Important passage right here, because the, the Apostle Peter, he is comparing and contrasting pri to, uh, pride with humility and what it means to be submitted. And to, uh, uh, he sets them at odds with each other, that to be humble you cannot be proud. When you're prideful, that means you lack humility. And this is a very important subject because God is actively involved in these two things. The Word of God says that God resists the proud. What does this mean? This is very important because this means that God doesn't only dislike pride. It's not only something that bothers God, but God is in inactivity against pride and those that are uh, proudful, uh, or are full of pride and are proud. God is resisting the proud, which means he is actively working against and distancing himself from 
the proud. But he gives, he gives grace to the humble. Now, grace, we have to realize that this word grace is a very, um, uh, it's a, a term that is full of so much meaning in the word of God. Uh, many theologians, uh, uh, many ministers have made the mistake of equating grace with mercy. This is not the case. In fact, mercy is only a very small part of what grace actually is. The grace of God is manifest in every single way that he gives us more than what we deserved, which is why even the gifts of the Spirit in the Apostle Paul, they are given by means that God didn't necessarily have to pour out mercy but God is giving us power in this world, power in this age that we did not do anything to earn or deserve. We did not train hard enough to get it. We did not do en uh, enough effort on our behalf, but God poured it out to the church and he gave gifts as the spirit desired to man so that we can operate on a higher plane than that of the natural world that we can operate in a supernatural level that would not be possible by science and human uh, and human rules of humanity and human kind so that god gives grace to the humble means that everything that is within the package of God and everything that God offers his people, he gives it to a, a, a specific person, that individual that is humble, right? We have to be careful because what this means is that you can be a child of God, have been born again, baptized in the name of Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, and still be resisted by God if we have pride in our hearts. We must seek to be humble. Now, in this context, what does it mean to be humble? Verse 6, it says, therefore, humble yourselves under this, uh, the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. It means submit yourself to the will of God. Submit to yourse yourself to the desires of God. That's what humility means. But now in verse 7, it classifies the specific kind of humility that the Apostle Peter is desiring to address here. And this sets everything, everything in a very important context, a context that connects very well with Jesus Christ being our rest or our Sabbath. It says, therefore, verse 6 again, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. In other words, he has a concern for you. He has a concern for your well-being. He watches over you. His eyes are directed towards you. He knows your name, therefore Cast all your care unto him. Hallelujah. Now, this, is, this sets this, uh, this concept of casting all your care and casting your burden upon God in a very interesting meaning because he is actually equating, the apostle Peter is equating being humble with casting your care. Wow, that is fascinating. It says here, that humble yourself, casting all your care upon him. It sets these two things in the same subject, in the same light, in the same category. To humble yourself means, or the marker of an individual that humbles themselves and submits themselves to the mighty hand of God, the mark the characteristic, the descriptor of an individual that has submitted themselves to God is an individual that casts his or her cares upon the Lord. That's powerful. That's powerful. If you're looking for 
proof as to whether an individual is really submitted to God and humble in the presence of God, you will find an individual that has learned to trust in Jesus. You will find a person that has learned to put their confidence in God. You will find an individual that has learned that God is their provider. God is the one that assures their well-being and their future. God is their all in all. This is a humble person. Now, we must ask ourselves today then, what about casting your care requires humility? What about casting your burdens on God requires humility? Because it seems like they don't both um, go hand in hand immediately at first glance. You can't really tell. But when you study what it takes... When you reflect upon yourself, when you reflect about what it takes to cast your care upon God, you will understand what it means. And the reason why casting your care requires humility. Because, and this is why, because casting your care before God means relinquishing control over your life it means giving up control over your future it means relinquishing the control over the plans that you have and what you think is going to happen in your life and what you think you should do in response of your trials of your needs of your sickness hey When we bring it into real life, then it becomes very clear. The provision of money, what you do to try to heal your body, and what you do to try to fix your situations, and what you do to try to fix that coworker that's bothering you, that supervisor that just keeps hounding you and keeps coming at you and 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 keeps persecuting you. What you think you should do about situations because many times we as human beings, we like taking control because we think we know what is best and so we choose methods of responding to situations. But God says, cast your care upon me. Wow. That means that you are giving up ownership over your future. You're giving up ownership over your problem. You're giving up ownership over what's to come. And many times what is to come, or at least what seems is around the corner, is so difficult to hold. It is so difficult to contemplate. It is so difficult to realize and say, God, look, you have told me that you're going to provide for my every need, but it looks like right now I'm going to have to work seven days a week. I can't go to church. I got I to gotta provide for my family. I got to keep working. But God says, look, uh, you need to come to the house of God. You cannot forsake the assembly of the brethren. You got to come to the house of God and worship his name. So you got to relinquish control. You got to let go, let go of the control and believe that God is going to provide for your need. That, that church, that people of God requires humility. That requires submitting. If you want to find then the marker of an individual who is not living in humility, The marker of an individual, and this is hard to hear because it's part of our nature as human beings to want to have control. The marker of an individual who is not living submitted to the will of God. If you are looking for a characteristic, you you will find a person who refuses to give God control over their future. I think this is hitting home for somebody tonight. You will find an individual who refuses to trust in God to supply their need, to work things out. See, that's when we start messing things up, though. When we start putting our hands on our situations, we start touching our situations and moving things, and we start trying to handle, we end up making a greater mess. 
And I don't know about you, but I've done this before. When I think I should respond a certain way in a certain situation, and I respond too quickly out of the rationality of my mind, I end up messing things up worse than what they originally were. I forgot to go to the presence of God and say, God, what do you have to say about this? I don't want to act in my anger. I don't want to act in vengeance. I don't want to act in retribution. I don't want to act in this and that way. I don't want to act with the carnal mind but I want to act with the mind of God I want to act with mercy with the spirit of peace and the spirit of unity a spirit of increase and fruitfulness in the Holy Ghost we end up messing things up so much when we desire to take control of what is to come this is why I believe The Lord Jesus Christ, in teaching his disciples, he tells them in Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, do not worry about tomorrow. If you read the verse prior, it is in response to, the context is that it is in a response to worries that might come to his disciples in concern about what clothes they're going to wear and what food they're going to eat and how are they going to be provided for preaching the gospel, going from city to city and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus tells them, look, don't worry about tomorrow. Seek first the kingdom of God and all of these things, they're going to be added to you. I'm going to provide. How? God how are you going to do that I don't see the way I don't see the evidence I don't see the proof but God says seek ye first the kingdom of heaven look don't worry about tomorrow don't worry about what is to come it's going to have its own worry when it comes all you have to worry about is being in the will of God today right now ask yourself Am I walking in the will of God? Am I obeying God? Am I submitting? Am I, am I humbling myself? Under, who is the almighty God? Who is the creator of heaven and earth? Who holds my future in his hands? What am I doing in response to the word? Even that Jesus Christ is my Sabbath. That Jesus Christ is my rest. How am I responding? You see... This is contrary. This works contrary to the very nature of human, the human mind, and who we are as human beings. As human beings, we are, we are predictive creatures. We are creatures that desire to predict the trajectory and we seek for patterns in life so that we can predict what is coming. This is part of the very nature of what it is to be human when we're children when we, even when we're infants we already begin this process to predict the trajectory of a ball when we throw an object we see it and we throw that object and children and infants are even doing this process for themselves they're understanding what it means to launch something in the air if I launch it with a certain amount of strength it's going to go this far but if I launch it with that amount a little bit stronger it's going to go further and if I throw it even harder it will go even further and so now if they're trying to aim at an object they're trying to predict what about the uh, the amount of pressure that I put on this ball is going to get this ball to where I want it to go. It's part of the very nature of what is called human cognition. The way that the mind works, the main that the, the mind works is that it's constantly trying to find patterns. This is not only in the very physical realm like a ball, but this is also in social situations. And very complex social community and psychological situations. We're constantly trying to predict meaning. What is the meaning? What is the meaning of this group of people? What is the meaning? When we first enter into a room, when we first enter into a grocery store, we look around and we say, what is the meaning of this grocery store? What are the signs that it's going to be safe for me to walk through this neighborhood? What are the signs that it's going to be safe? And we're constantly, even without thinking about it, we're in a state of attempting to predict what is the outcome of my life at this moment in time. 
and humanity, the world, we have gotten into some big problems because we do not realize that many times those things that are dominating our predictive center of consciousness, those things that are dominating the predictive part of our hearts are actually corrupt. And our assumptions about the evidence of whether something is good or bad and whether someone is dangerous or not, it's tainted. It is tainted perhaps by past experiences and ways of looking at the world and nobody really taught us uh, how to see the world in a certain way and so we predict things about other people that are wrong and many times it takes time to really deconstruct that mindset to, to really break that down can I tell you that that's all what the word of God is all about because the word of God says hallelujah that the weapons of our warfare they are not carnal, but they're powerful through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, submitting, bringing every thought into submission to Christ. Wow. The Bible actually foretold this. It said, hey, look, when you're in the world, you're pro even from your culture that you belong to, you're programmed in ways that is not pleasing to God. We've learned to make meaning of our world in ways that is not pleasing to the Lord. So we have to go through a process of submitting our hearts and our minds to God and saying, you know what, God, sometimes it doesn't make sense what the word of God says, but let God be true and every man be a liar I'm gonna give my heart and my mind to be transformed by the power of your word and the power of the Holy Ghost we need to submit ourselves to the authority of the word of God and even though we have we're used to thinking of certain ways about certain people and about no we need to submit ourselves to God and say God when it comes between your word and me I am wrong and you are right and even though it's conflicting against what I've been told my whole life I am submitting myself to you and the future that you tell me I'm a part of that is what I'm going to believe not the future that somebody has told me I'm a part of or the kind of person that some person that some educational institution has tried to convince me I'm a part of or some type of social social commentaries that are telling me I am this I am that that I'm always oppressed that I'm always under uh, uh, under some type of oppression and always I'm this kind of group that's that's specialized and marginalized and I'm not going to let people convince me or tell me what I am when I came to God I made a decision that I am to believe that I am what the word of God says that I am and if I I am victorious and if God has given me victory to tread upon the head of serpents and to walk believing that God holds my future guess what I'm gonna believe it I will believe that I will believe that future I will believe what God is trying to mold in my heart yeah, it doesn't matter what man says about me. It doesn't matter what man says about my past. Uh, that your past is broken. You can't be anything good. Look, your mind and your heart, it's too fragmented. You've done too much evil. You see, the world is tr constantly trying to put uh, corrupt ways of thinking in our minds uh, to make predictions about our future that only end up in tragedy. But God says, hey, look, uh, I have given you victory through my blood. And I've given you a new future. I have given you a new destiny and you can start bled of destruction instead of a life that is full of failure. I am your God. I am your God. And I hold your future in my hands. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, God. Yes, God. That doesn't keep us as human beings from coming into conflict with the word of God because of the nature of our mind, the nature of our hearts. 
Yeah, that's right. We can actually see literal stories of this occurring in the Bible. Where the story of the Bible, the narrative of the Bible gives us an example of what it means to fall into this mindset of predicting doom. Yet being reminded that it is the word of God in which we should stand upon. I want to take you to one of those stories. I want to take you to Luke 22. Luke chapter 8 verse 22. The word of God says here. Now it happened on a certain day. That he got into a boat with his disciples. And he said to them. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. And he said to them. Let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. The word of God was released upon them. The word of God was released even into their future. Let us cross over to the other side of the lake. Verse 23, but as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came on the lake and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Wow. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. But he said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, who can this be? For he commands even the winds and water, and they obey him. Wow. Here we can see the story of the disciples. After receiving... The word from Jesus, let us go to the other side of the lake. They could have safely assumed that because Jesus said, let us, which means every one of us who I'm talking to, go to the other side means that there is a plan on the other side. There is something that God is going to do on the other side of the lake. It was Jesus who released the word, and it was the job of the disciples to believe. See, what the disciples did not know is that it was on the other side of that lake that God, that Jesus was about to release a demon-possessed man. It is this man whom we call Legion. A man who was possessed by a multitude of demonic powers. Jesus was on his way to release him of this oppression and this possession. However, it was necessary for them to cross the lake. To cross to the other side. And while they were crossing, however, the winds began to pick up. The storm began to pick up. The wind began to blow and waves began to threaten their lives or so they thought. They began to yell, Lord, look, don't you care about our lives? Don't you care that we are perishing? Don't you care that we're about to die? And you see, look, these individuals, the disciples, had very good reason to think they were going to die. Because they were men of experience. They were men of who fished that sea. They fished that lake. They knew what it meant to fish on that lake. They knew what it meant when a storm came. They were familiar. And because of their past familiarity, they had a pattern of thinking. They had predictive ways of thinking that was saying, look, the wind is blowing this hard, the waves are this high, we're going to die. And we know we're going to die. We're going to perish. The boat is being filled by water. We're trying to cast it out. And, they, and their experience would have told them all of the signs are telling us that we are going to perish. Somebody wake up Jesus because he said we're going to the other side, but we're about to die right here. And what did Jesus do when he woke up? He calmed the seas. He calmed the storm. And he asked them, where is your faith? Wow. You see... The disciples' whole life, their experience of working those waters 
legitimately told them they were going to perish. And any scientific individual or rational individual who heard their plea would have said they have a very good point. Look, all of the evidence, this is not exaggerating. They are men of the sea. They know what they're into, and they know that they're at very big risk of dying. However, what Jesus was asking of them was not a logical mind or a rational way about thinking about the evidence of your life. What he was asking of them was faith to believe in the word that was already released to them that said, let us go to the other side but they were too busy projecting a future based on their experience they were too busy projecting a future of doom they were projecting that i can imagine they were already imagine imagining what it would have been like to sink into the into the lake and and swallow and breathe in gallons of water and suffocate underneath that water you see we are very imaginative creatures we are creatures, humankind, with deep and meaningful imaginations, especially when they are a result of fear, when they are motivated by fear. They have done studies, you know, and I'm so grateful for what I'm studying right now in my and my program, I'm in school studying a specific program, which it studies the nature of the mind. And when we look into the mind, the mind never stays in what we would call the head or the brain. Every thought and every imagination that we have has a correlation to bodily experience. What does this mean? This is the reason why when you see someone hanging off of the side of a cliff, our palms begin to sweat. And we ourselves begin to feel what is called a cringe. Why? Our bodies, not just our thoughts, but our bodies themselves are reacting to the imagination of what it would be like in that person's shoes hanging off by their fingertips from a cliff. And we react to, to individuals falling. We say, ooh, 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 that must have hurt. Why is it that we react in our bodies in such a way? It's because whatever we are imagining about the situation, we are also in a way experiencing it in our bodies. So the very act, the very fact that the disciples were casting out the water, they were experienced fishermen, they were saying, Jesus, we're perishing. Don't you care? We're about to die. That whatever imaginations they were having, a future of drowning, I can imagine they'd already felt what it was like for their throat to tighten up. They were feeling the suffocation of their lungs. They were feeling what it meant to desperately go under and not be able to get to the top. They were embodying with themselves anxiety and fear in their body, in their hands, in their feet, in their chest, in their back, in their mind, in their emotions. They were living the fear of dying. But Jesus Christ told them, where is your faith? I have already told you a word and that word is going to take you to the other side. It says, let us go. Let us go. You and me, let's go to the other side and even if the circumstances of this world seem to threaten your existence and seem to threaten your health and seem to threaten your future do not project into your future what you think is going to happen but begin to project into the future the word of faith that I have given you I have already told you I am going to make a way so guess what you need to start thinking you need to start praising God because he's going to make a way. You need to start you need to start praising God because he's going to make a way. You need to start glorifying him because you have the blessed assurance that God is going to take you through. Yes, that's what you got to do. That's what you got to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So Philippians 4, 8 says, whatsoever things are true. Uh -huh. And notice, I, I've, I've, I've explained this in a few places, and we've had some preachers come through here who have explained this as well. That something is true 
doesn't mean that that's reality. Because truth functions in a different plane than reality. Reality said that the disciples were about to die on the lake. But the truth was already established. Not by the laws of this world. But by the word of God. Truth was already ekonobosha. It was already founded upon. Truth was sitting upon the word of God. That said, we are going to go to the other side. We are going to make it to the other side. And that defies reality. It defies the facts. It defies what anybody can say about the details of your situation. Truth stands upon the word of God. There is so much depth to that understanding. Not enough for me to explain. Neither do I know everything about it. But it is worth praying about and studying on your own time. Truth is founded on the word of God. You see, true, truth said, let us go to the other side. The lie said, we are going to die. And rational minds could have said, we are li likely going to sink and drown. But the truth of God, it is forever established on his word. And the word of God, even when reality seems to defy what the word of God has spoken, the word of God has dominion even over the laws of this world, even over the facts of our circumstance, we have truth and the word of God like a bulldozer can run over the facts of any circumstance, hallelujah, and any situation. But it takes humility to deny ourselves. I hope in, somebody's hearing me. And understanding what I'm trying to say today. It takes humility to deny our own logic and rationality and say, God, I know that the facts are telling me one thing, but I do believe that you are my Sabbath. I believe you are my rest. I believe you're my provider. I believe you do all things well. And I believe you do above and beyond what we can ever ask or think. And today I defy, hallelujah, I defy what the facts are telling me. And I choose to believe in your word. It takes humility to submit yourself under that. Hmm. It's the truth. And this is how it's related to the fact that Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. Because if we look at the stories that we explored two weeks ago talking about Israel and how Israel, they had to trust in God. The word of God says that God was sending down manna from heaven and they were to collect manna for six days. But on the seventh day, they were not to pick up a single morsel of manna. They were to trust that God would supply their need throughout that day that they did. It was the same scenario on the seventh year. They were not allowed to sow or to reap from the fields, but they were to trust that God would give them enough for three years on the sixth year. It's about trusting God. It's about defying what everyone can see in this world. It's about defying what the human mind can rationalize. This is why the just shall live by faith and not by what can be seen with the human eye. What can be observed with your rationality by faith and not by sight. I know I'm talking to somebody today. And I'm helping somebody today get through because the truth is, is that life oftentimes it gets very hard when you start going through really significant problems, significant sickness, significant need, and it gets hard to believe in God. But I have one thing to tell you today. Hold on. Hold on to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hold on to his word. Hold on to his promise. Hold on 
to his spirit. For dear life, hold on to the hope that is in God. Do not let go and don't let your eyes be distracted by the waves that are, that are, that are crashing against the boat that is your life. Don't be afraid by the wind that is hissing and blowing and the thunder that is striking because those are only things that you can see with your rational mind. But there's something else that's working in your situation that cannot be observed with the eyes. And it is the word of God that has been invested in your soul. The word of God that is in your life. And it's going to carry you through. It's going to help you go on. I've come here to tell somebody that you have the assurance from God that you're going to make it through the other side. You're going to make it with victory today. You're going to make it blessed and highly favored because it is the God that you serve. And in the end, your story will be a testimony of the greatness of God, of the might of God, of the power of God. Receive it right now in your spirit, in Jesus' name. Just raise your hand right now, wherever you're at. You need that assurance of the spirit. You need that encouragement of the word of God. Don't you worry. God is here to minister faith to your life today to look beyond your circumstance. Do it, God, today in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Ghost. It's the assurance of the spirit that he wants to give his people today. I'm reminded of this old Spanish hymn that I used to sing with my family back home. The song is called Fortaleza Divina. Divine strength comes from God. This divine strength to keep moving forward and believe. No, don't worry about the storm. Look past the current circumstance and realize that God is taking you. He's taking you to the other side. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Wow. With all of your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. Now, this is, this is very significant that it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. This recalls, this includes not just the thoughts of your mind, but it includes the emotions of your heart. Trust in the Lord with your heart, with your emotions, with your affect, with that which is in you. With that which is emotionally stirred in you. Get involved with the word of God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Then it says, lean not unto your own understanding. Well, you know, this is, this is even more significant, right? Because it doesn't even say, don't trust in your understanding. It says, don't even lean on it. Hey, don't even use it as support. Come on. Don't even use it to even try. Come on. And now this is hard. This is a lot harder than many times what it seems. Because we're saying, I'm not even going to use my own understanding as a crutch. And I'm really hurting right now. And I'm really trying to calculate all the things that could go right and could go wrong. It says, don't even be tempted to lean on your understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your understanding. And what's going to happen? He's He's going to direct your paths. He's going to help you move forward. He's going to help you get to the other side. God is going to help you. Through whatever you're getting through, you're going through right now, he will direct your path. You know what it need, what's required to direct your path? Not knowledge of. All you need is knowledge of the next step. One more step. If you take one more step in the will of God, you're still in the path. God is going to direct your path. You see, so many of us, we want to know what's going on.
What's going to happen next week? What's going to happen next month? Don't worry about tomorrow. What's going to happen next year? God, I don't see the plan. I, I don't see what you're doing. I, I don't know. I don't know how to grasp it with my, lean not unto your own understanding. God, I cannot see what's going, what's the strategy here? I just need to know, God, please just tell me the strategy. What are you going to do? How are you going to provide? Who are you bringing into my life to make this happen? I need to know. And God's saying, no, you don't need to know. Lean not unto your own understanding just worry about today yeah 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 because even the longest journeys are they are they are taken one step at a time even the longest most successful most victorious journeys are only done one step at a time yes god is going to give you direction he's going to give you help and it's sometimes it's not help for what's coming a week later or a month later. It's help for what you need to be doing today. What is the next step? If you stay in the will of God today, you're going to get to where you need to go to. If you stay in the will of God tomorrow, you're going to go to where you need to go to. If you stay in the will of God the next day, you're going to go to where you need to go to. God has a future for you, and all you need to do is worry about one day at a time. One step at a time, stay in the will of God. Stay loving God. Come on, stay worshiping God. Stay praising God. Stay good at a time. Stay living for God. And somebody needs encouragement today. Somebody needs help from the Holy Ghost to make it through. Because you are surrounded. And I'm not downplaying your circumstance. Absolutely not. I'm not downplaying what you're going through. But I'm telling you right now, above and beyond and greater than anything you can go through in your life, you're in the hands of God. Keep trusting in him and make Jesus Christ your rest. The Holy Spirit wants to minister to your spirit today. Wants to minister to your, your soul. And even more, as I'm wrapping up tonight, the Holy Spirit wants to help you cast down imaginations. Those imaginations that you've been holding, <laughs> you've been holding it for so long in fear. Somebody under the sound of my voice, you've been playing too much with hypotheticals of your future. And you see, if you remember what I was talking about, how in our bodies we experience the fear that we think in our minds. So many times we as individuals, we can go through so many different scenarios and hypotheticals about our futures that we gather upon our heart and our mind and our back on us burdens that belong to lives that are even part of our story. Futures that have not even come to pass. Lives that are based off of imaginations in our minds about where we might go, how we might end, what our destruction might be, and where our, our hurt and our bitterness might take us and our anger might take us and, our, and, our, and, 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 and afflictions might take us. And we gather and we heap upon ourselves hypothetical futures that are not even part of our lives. They're just something that we've conjured up in our imagination. That's where people, they start bugging out. They start, they start in, their, in their mind, they start breaking psychologically because they're heaping upon their soul imagination after imagination hypothetical destruction after hypothetical destruction loneliness upon loneliness upon loneliness and separation and that's where depression comes and anxiety it begins to build up because you're building up thoughts about your future and God's trying to tell you take your hands off the wheel tonight take your hands off of your future take your hands off of that kind of contemplation you need to think about whatsoever things are true today whatsoever things are honest whatsoever things are just whatsoever things are pure whatsoever things are lovely if there is any good report if anything of virtue or worthy of praise 
think upon these things because God, he has not planned for your destruction. He has planned for your blessing and your fruitful increase. He has planned for a fruitful future. Take your mental hands off of the steering wheel today. And as the Apostle Peter says, as the praise team begins coming up tonight, he says, humble yourself. Humble yourself before the Lord. Submit yourself under the mighty hand of God, casting your care upon him. Casting your care upon him. And it ends with this. For he cares for you. Wow. That it means that it says casting your care is significant. Because it doesn't mean set it down kindly. Set it down nicely. That care that has been haunting you. Hallelujah. That burden that has been on your shoulders. Now go ahead and just gently. It says, cast your care. Cast it away from you. Cast your care upon the Lord. And then it says, for he, how ironic, cares. Wow. He cares for who? For you. He cares for you. Wow. That burden that you've been carrying, you can cast it off because there is somebody who has a burden that he is carrying for you, and his name is Jesus. Jesus cares for you. That means he's carrying a burden, and that burden is your life. Hallelujah. That burden is your future. That burden is your situation. The Spirit is carrying a burden and to get you through. You're not by yourself in your life tonight. You're not by yourself. You're not on your own. He knows your name. And today, God just wants to minister to you that divine strength, that divine assurance, that you belong to that you belong to him. And he belongs to you. Just lift your hands wherever you're at if you need it tonight. Father, I pray for every individual under the sound of my voice. You asked a man one time, do you believe? And he said, I believe God. Help my unbelief. Somebody needs help believing that you are who you say you are tonight, God. I pray that by the power of your word, you would just increase faith tonight, God. Increase believing in the hearts of your people and minister, God, assurance in their spirits that you are theirs and they are yours and they belong to you. Practice this, church. Practice this. Read through these scriptures. Whatsoever thing is true and honest and just and pure and lovely, think on these things. That is the future that God has for you. You are blessed and highly favored today because you belong to God. God bless you tonight as the praise team ministers in song. Blessed assurance, Jesus is. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. the 
Gloria, Baba, sí, le leo. 